Welcome back to the data science and machine learning track. Uh, next up, we have Michael Griminger, who will be talking about how to build and distribute data science apps with Pyodide. Over to you, Michael. All right. All right. Sounds good. Thank you for the introduction. Let me share my screen here quick. All right. And I want to switch. Let's see. I want to see my browser tab, so I have to do things in a certain order here. Um, there we go. Okay, it's loading up my slides. So I'm uh, Michael Greminger. So I'm an associate professor at the University of Minnesota Duluth. And so I teach in the mechanical and industrial engineering department. And so I wanna talk about a way to kind of distribute data science apps using Pyodide. So um, I'll just get started. So some of you may be, may be familiar with Pyodide, but what it does is it compiles CPython, so the whole of CPython, into WebAssembly. So WebAssembly is a format, binary format for running binaries on uh, in a web browser. And so there's other ways to run Python in the browser, but there's a couple things that make Pyodide kind of unique and kind of revolutionary in what you can do. And one of the things is um, it includes a lot of the data science packages, so it includes NumPy, includes pandas, matplotlib, scipy, scikit-learn. So all these that depend on kind of C dependencies uh, and some Fortran dependencies can, can be compiled to this WebAssembly. So they come along for the ride. So I like something like Python where you can run Python in the browser. This allows you to run all these data science packages and that's where the real power comes in. Plus by being compiled to WebAssembly, it's not quite native speeds, but it's actually pretty fast. So you're getting you know, 50% of native speeds or even better sometimes uh, with these uh, WebAssembly uh, Pyodide packages. Um, and so some of the data science packages I talked about, um, and I'll talk a little bit about the implementation details. So I uh, use this Pyodide.load package from the JavaScript side to load these pre-built packages that come bundled with Pyodide. Um, so like I said, NumPy, uh, Pandas, SciPy, and, and this is really powerful because there's not, in the JavaScript ecosystem, there are not these advanced tools for doing data science. You really, this really enables something that you wouldn't otherwise be able to do uh, in the browser. Um, and so for loading built-in packages, you just use simple pyodide.load package. If you have a package that isn't bundled with pyodide, but it's a pure Python package, it's actually pretty simple to load something called micropip gets bundled with pyodide. And what that does is it allows you to load a pure Python wheel. It won't load a wheel that has, has to be compiled, but it will load a pure Python wheel. And there are a couple of limitations, like you can't do HTTP requests from pyodide. So there's some limitations due to the browser sandbox, but in general, you can run pretty much any package that's uh, kind of pure Python using uh, pyodide. Um, and you know, I was kind of skeptical, of kind of using this micro pip as a way to load packages, but it's actually pretty fast. I've I've kind of moved my example. I'll show you to using micro pip as a way to load these wheels, and it's actually ran faster. Part of it's because I upgraded a recent version of Pyodide, but so it's it's very efficient loading the packages this way. Now the third way is okay. Let's say you have a package that isn't in Pyodide, but it depends on C or Cython or C plus plus or Fortran. There you're gonna have to do a little bit more work, and what you have to do is set up a Pyodide build environment and there's instructions on the page. So if I go to the Pyodide help here, I'll kind of go back and forth on some of these things. It has a really good instructions for building from source and um, and creating a Pyodide package. You kind of have to go through those instructions if you have a package that depends on C or C++ that isn't bundled with Pyodide. Um, if it's C in Cython, it's actually pretty easy. Um, usually, well, usually it's pretty easy if it depends on a setup.py file. What, what the build tools do for Pyodide is they run setup.py, cap it captures all the compile commands, it doesn't actually compile it, and then replays those compile commands using Inscripten, which is the, the WebAssembly compiler, and it adds appropriate flags and things. So it's a, sometimes it's able to automatically do that. With C++ and Fortran, it's a little more difficult. Right now, there's not a way to compile Fortran directly to WebAssembly. So what uh, Pyodide does for SciPy, which has Fortran, is it, it it builds it converts it to C first uses a, a, a F to C a script to convert to C first and that's why and SciPy it's actually an older version because more recent versions of SciPy depend more on Fortran so that is still a work in progress. Um, that talk we saw this morning about L Fortran that tool since it compiles the LLVM will help in, in getting this infrastructure for Fortran to WebAssembly kind of getting more mature. So that there, there's a future to getting Fortran. It's just right now, Fortran is really challenging. C++ is kind of in the middle. 
Um, exceptions don't work right now properly. So if your code throws an exception, you can't catch it, which is kind of a problem. But that's that's you know these are things that are being worked on. C and Cython work pretty well. Um, so it's, we're in the early days of Pyodide. So you know these things will get improved over time. Um, so okay. So how do I want to? How would I want to use this in a web app? And there's kind of three ways you can think about using Pyodide in a web app. Um, you can think about it. Some people see it as, well, wow, I can do Python. I don't have to do JavaScript anymore. Um, and some people are looking at that. I, I don't think this is where PyDead would shine. I mean, even though there are people, it'll get better. It does take about 10 seconds or so for you to get a full PyDead environment up and running in the browser, which a 10 second delay to interactivity is kind of a problem. Um, so it is something you can do, and I think, by using it instead of JavaScript, you're missing out on a lot of the advanced JavaScript tools I'll kind of talk about later that do help with interactivity. Um, so this is something that's there, but I don't think it's the primary use of PyDide. A second one that's very useful and already kind of in development now, active development, is using it to run Python in a browser as an interactive sort of REPL environment where you're typing in code, getting results, much like a Jupyter uh, notebook sort of environment. And there's a bunch of tools. So I forgot to talk about the history of PyDide. So PyDide came out of Mozilla. Uh, so Michael uh, uh, dropped Boom, he, he developed Pyodide initially out of Mozilla and as part of this iodide project where you can run JavaScript, it's a notebook environment or Python. All of this is running in the browser. There's no server involved other than the static files that are being hosted. Um, and, and so, but now Pyodide's moved out of Mozilla and it's kind of successfully kind of, uh, is a standalone project and it has a active core team. I'm just a user of PyDide, I have contributed to it, but the, it has an active core team that is very active in kind of improving PyDide. Uh, so you have these few notebook environments. So there's a Starboard notebook is another one that can do JavaScript or Python using PyDide. And it's all in the browser, there's no server involved. Um, Jupyter Lite's actually just porting Jupyter Lab to actually just use a kernel instead of being on a server actually in, in your browser. So it's all pretty, these things are already out there. Um, so that's the second way to use it, kind of a REPL sort of thing. The third way, which is what I'm gonna spend most of my time talking about is as a replacement for a Python backend that you usually traditionally use for a kind of a computational task. So instead of sending off some Python, some computation to be done on a Python on a server and sending it back to your front end, let's just do that inside the browser in Pyodide. Um, so kind of a traditional data science in browser without Pyodide is you have a Python backend that's doing your computations using those tools you can't get in JavaScript like SymPy and, and NumPy and SciPy. And then you have a browser front end. And there's ways to do this without even using JavaScript. You have Plotly Dash, which will do a lot of this wiring up for you. This data is going back and forth usually in some kind of JSON format. Um, so what we're doing with Pyodide here is bring all this into the browser, right? Bring the, the, the back end server, just put it in a web worker and the browser. So a web worker, if you're familiar with multi-processing in Python, that module, web workers are pretty much exactly the same. So you have a separate sub-process that doesn't block your main UI thread. You can communicate it with uh, message passing. Uh, you, usually I, I'm sending JSON across, but you can actually send uh, JavaScript uh, objects across this boundary into the web worker and everything gets copied. So it's like a me message passing sort of interface. And within that web worker, you load up PyDide. And the benefit of there is that 10 seconds or 20 seconds, depending on what you're loading, that it takes to get PyDide up and running, your UI thread is going and you, you already have interactivity on your site. So you're not waiting for that. And it allows you to, if you have a computation that takes a while, it's not gonna block your browser thread. So there are some limitations in running in a web worker where, um, uh, the resources that the browser gives PyDide can be a limitation. I'll talk about that uh, uh, later. So let me, I think the best way to kind of illustrate this is with a case study. And so I teach uh, in the mechanical engineering department. So I had this, um, I wanted the students to do an optimization problem uh, using some uh, optimization tools. The course is primarily computer aided design. So they're using, you know, SOLIDWORKS and fine element software. And so I want to give them this tool to analyze the results from that. And so I want to distribute this data science app to mechanical engineering students that can run on a wide range of computers. Now, both university owned and student owned computers. Now the problem, if anybody's tried to deploy software on a university owned computer, they'll realize that this is actually a harder problem than uh, deploying it to students. Um, because, you know, you have to work, you know, it's a lot of lead time to get the software on the computers, it's difficult to update it. Um, so the solution I came with when I first started, and you'll, you'll probably 
uh, oh, let me talk about the problem first. So what we're trying to do is we have this panel, right? Just an example problem and we're trying to optimize it. And so we have a couple input parameters, rib height and material thickness, and we want to minimize mass and want to minimize displacement. And so this is like a typical kind of uh, design constraint problem. We have competing design constraints. And so they do a finite element analysis. They do kind of a design of studies where they go through uh, full factorial design of experiments and they get these uh, kind of orange points out as the simulation runs. And what we want to find is we fit a response surface to that data and find this uh, Pareto front, basically a set of efficient designs where you can't improve both objectives simultaneously. So if you pick a design, you want it to be on this curve. If you pick a design that's inside this curve, you're kind of leaving some performance on the table. And so this is a tool I want to give them is to be able to run the study in their finite element software and about to generate this curve. And so that's our kind of application I'm trying to develop. When I first started teaching this class, the solution I came up with, and you know, people probably laugh at this, but it was uh, do Excel spreadsheet with VBA macros. And it's not because I didn't know Python at the time. I actually had prototyped this in Python. I wish I could have distributed it in Python at that time, but I was faced with kind of having to be in a notebook or something like that. And the students, you know, I spent a couple of days on this in this particular class and I don't want the primary task being setting up a Python environment and setting up a notebook and learning how to use a notebook and stuff like that. I want it to be a fairly intuitive user intuitive process. The main tool is they're learning the finite element analysis, not how to program in Python. And not that I'm hesitant to teach Python. When I teach my finite element class, I, I use Col, uh, Google Colab and have them actually programming. But in this case, the programming wasn't the goal. The goal was to have them do this optimization problem. And so in that sense, the Excel macro is nice. They could run it anywhere. They could visualize their data. I could add uh, GUI elements here. The user interface wasn't super intuitive as it you know, I would like it to be, but it was good enough where they could run it and I could walk them through it and they could generate their plots. And so, you know, the key here was that it was something that was accessible for the students to learn without me having to install Python environment and learning a bunch of commands. Um, but now the updated solution, I finally get to program it in Python now, um, is to use PyDide running in a web worker. Now they have a user, user interface uh, kind of in, um, uh, in the browser, and I'm using Plotly to, to plot the data, and the PyDide is running the optimization. So I can just kind of show you um, this, um, this running here. And so I have this on uh, GitHub, the response surface Pareto uh, generator tool. It's kind of an example program that people can use as kind of a starting point if you want to build an app like this. Um, but just kind of show you the app. They can import the data by dropping it on a file from a CSV file. They can browse to the file. I have example data here. But if I reload this page, kind of the key here is even though Pyodide's loading in the background now, and it's going to take about 10 seconds for this particular program, but I can already start interacting with the website. I'm not waiting for that to happen because this is all happening in JavaScript. And so I can tell it what the input parameters are, tell it what the output parameters are. I can go to the Pareto plot, tell it what I want in the X and Y axis. It becomes more meaningful if you have more than two parameters. Uh, and then generate the Pareto data. So this is now calling into my, my, my back end, the web worker, calling a PyDide, doing the optimization. Um, and that's why it takes a few seconds. So it's saying it's updating here. And hopefully that plot should show up. And this is plotted using Plotly in, in the front end. And so the students don't even need to know it's running Python in the back end, but I get that. Uh, nonlinear optimization tool, constraint optimization that I need um, uh, to do to do this particular uh, app, all with serving on static websites. And so let me talk a little bit about the implementation details. Um, so I have it on GitHub, so you can look at it if you're trying to develop something uh, similar. I am using Svelte for the UI interaction for the JavaScript side. I'll show you a little bit what that looks like, but if you've, if the last time you've done JavaScript was using jQuery or you haven't done any JavaScript before, I think Svelte is a, a great tool to start with. There's been a lot of advancements in kind of these JavaScript frameworks. Svelte is by far the easiest, it's most approachable. You're building things in HTML and CSS, so you get to use those. You're not kind of reinventing the wheel and you only kind of reach for Svelte when you're doing some interactivity. And so you can kind of uh, use the minimum that you want. Um, you can do, I'm doing static deployment using GitHub pages. Um, and so the nice thing about this is you just, you know, GitHub pages is free and you can do a static site and kind of deploy this for free. Um, plot, you're probably familiar with Plotly using the Python uh, front end for, or interface. I'm using plotly.js, uh, which is just the, they, they package it for nodes. You can use it directly in the, in the front end. So I'll show you a little bit what that looks like, kind of loading PyDide in the, the web worker. Um, 
So let me, and I'll zoom in on this once I get it open here. But the web worker, just to show you what the JavaScript side of it looks like a little bit, it's pretty simple. This is actually a short web worker script. And what it's doing is setting up Pyodide. I'm telling it where it is relative in my static site here, though you could load it from CDN as well. The Pyodide has a CDN. Um, I'm loading MicroPip because I need to load this trust constraint package. Now, since they don't have the latest version of SciPy, I needed to pull this trust constraint uh, optimization package out. It's a pure Python, so I just made a wheel out of it, made a package, and so I'm using MicroPip. This program runs this in Python, so I import MicroPip and do the uh, install of that, and actually just runs just as fast as the native packages that Pyodide builds for you. Um, and then I load up my Python script, and so if I look back at that, the nice thing about this approach is your business logic, you know, in this case my optimization is done all in Python, it's, it's on None of it's in JavaScript. And um, it runs this script. And the last line, the way PyDead works, is it returns this object. So I have an object that just is a function, a pointer to the function. So I can call this function from JavaScript. And basically, it creates the plot. And if I scroll up, I'm exchanging data back and forth in JSON. And so these are the plots. And it looks, it'll look pretty familiar to doing Plotly. I'm just putting it in a dictionary. So it's an object that it'll turn into JSON. And so it just returns that, and it gets plotted on, on the front end. Um, and so that's kind of the structure uh, there. And so let me show you a different type of app. So it, you know, this one is an equation type solver app that does uh, uh, unit tracking. It has the same basic structure where I have a web worker that's doing the Pyodide uh, part of it. It's doing the, the SymPy. And then I have the interface. And here I want to have some data persistence. So I'm saving these sheets. Uh, it's kind of an almost like a notebook environment to a, a, a SQL server. And so here I haven't abandoned Python entirely. It's the fast API is the back end. But here I don't have to do any of the Python on the back end. And it's important here because in this environment, let me just show you the page. Uh, so it's called Engineering Paper. Now, unfortunately, this one's not open source, but it follows the same structure as the other one I was showing you. Um, but basically, allows you to enter in the equations. And um, like here, it's solving a, a, this a quadratic equation. And it gives you results. And if I change something here, if I put a uh, constant two times, it will takes a little bit to update because it's solving this equation. But it's going to solve that in the back end. Um, and then I get the solution to that. Um, and so. But the problem is I could put an equation here that will make the, the Python go into an infinite loop. And I don't want to do that on a server. Um, and so this allows me to have just do everything in a static website, just have the, the sharing, the saving of the sheets happen on, on the front end. So let me show you. If I reload, I'm going to do a new sheet here. Um, I'm going to reload this page. I'm going to force uh, PyDad to reload. And so you can see it's loading down here, but I can type in my equation. So x equals 3, uh, and I can put units in here. And if I do, so this is all happening in JavaScript. So the parsing of these equations is all happening in JavaScript. Um, and it's going to send it to Python to do the computation. So if I do uh, square root, so let me do it this way, square root x squared. So that by the time I'm typing it, PyDide's already loaded. So I won't even notice. And so it's going to give me that solution. Oops, it failed to load. OK. Um, so I was refresh. It doesn't. One thing it doesn't work on uh, Safari. So I guess um, because occasionally in in Pyodide, um, well, I'll get into that uh, the Safari part of it later. Um, so, but it allows you to kind of do the stuff in JavaScript that JavaScript's good at, which is the user interaction, and do the computations on Python, what Python's good at, and, and combine those together. Um, so the question may come up, well, is there a way to do this without JavaScript, um, right? Because it is a whole different paradigm. You know, the first time I typed console.log in Python, I knew I had been doing JavaScript too much, right? And so there is kind of this mental shift between JavaScript and Python. So you don't want to have to learn a whole new tool. The answer is right now, you still need to use JavaScript to build an app this way. But I think there are ways to make this so you can just do it from Python. So if you have tools like Dash, Panel, or Streamlit, which are designed to, you build it in Python, and it makes a front end for you. Right now, those are set up to use servers. But you could build tools like that that output a Pyodide type static site. And so I think there's a kind of a, a good future for being able to do these sorts of things uh, in um, 
um, you know, without having the right JavaScript. Right now, you do have the right JavaScript, but I think there's a way uh, to not do that. The one thing I did want to show you is that the with the Svelte, if I show you this response service program, let me show you what some of the Svelte looks like, because actually that's pretty approachable for somebody who has some experience with HTML, some experience with um, um, with um, uh, CSS. So this is like the plot module in in JavaScript or in Svelte. Uh, can people hear me? I'm getting some dinging. Um, I don't know if I got disconnected. Uh, can, can people hear me? Or did I get disconnected? Uh, we can still hear you. Your uh, shared screen is uh, uh, possibly an issue. If you OK. OK, so I'm back again. I think I got disconnected for a little bit. So let me reshare. Sorry about that. All right, go back to my browser page. Um, go back to full screen. And all right, so what I was going to show you is that Svelte component. And so basically, you have some script part that handles the interaction. On load, I make the plotly plot. And then whenever I get new data, I just plot the new plotly plot and just as a kind of JSON type object. And then I just have the HTML here. And so with, let me show you a different one, like the table or actually the tabs. Um, you basically, with Svelte, you have your script with the JavaScript, your style, which is your CSS, and then you have your just HTML. So it's pretty approachable, I think. These tools have become very kind of powerful. All right, and so let me, so I think the future will allow us, even though the JavaScript I think is pretty approachable, it's worth learning it, but uh, I think um, the tools could be built so you could do this all in Python, like some other way Dash is. All right, so I do want to point out some roadblocks you might run into. As you saw, I think if I just would have waited longer, that would have reloaded, but because my internet connection is a little slow right now. But um, it's early days for Pyodides. It means it just means it's changing faster. There's active community building it, but and also for Wasm, like I said, there's not a Fortran compiler directly to Wasm yet, but it seems we're very close to having that. Uh, so there's early days for that, but I think that stuff will be solved. Uh, the stack size is limited, so you might run into recursion limits, like for example, SymPy. So C Python has a stack size of a thousand. Um, you have, um, and but in, and it, when you're running in a web worker, we're pretty constrained environment. So sometimes your stack size or your recursion limits down to like 200 or something. So it's trying to set it automatically, but for like the engineering paper, I have to set it to something around 200 just to make sure it doesn't run into a recursion limit. So that is a limit. That's also why it doesn't work in a web worker in Safari because Safari gives it even less resources. And it's a little difficult to get stuff working in Safari, but it works in Chrome and Firefox. Um, so old version of SciPy there, 0 0.17, because after that, they started using more Fortran. As the Fortran compiling situation gets better, that will be more recent version. Um, large, complicated modules can be difficult to package. So one one you know kind of a perennial request is to have OpenCV put into PyDide. That's just a very big package. It may be possible, but especially that depends a lot on C++, that can be challenging to get those some of the bigger packages into PyDide. Though it you know, doesn't mean it won't happen eventually. Debugging is challenging. You end up writing a, a lot of print statements to debug because you don't have that sort of same interaction with the runtime that you do when you're running it on your computer. So debugging, you know, is is limited as well. And so there, I just wanted to kind of show you one case study. Um, so you can go to this um, uh, this GitHub page to see an example. Um, and so, yeah, I'm ready to answer some some questions if, if there are any. So if people can just uh, drop questions in the Q&A and let's all thank Michael. So uh, one of the questions, Michael, was uh, what alternatives you considered when you switched to Pyodide um, compared to, say, hosted dashboards or things? And it sounds like static deployment was was really the key thing you were looking for that, that made yeah. Pyodide the, the, the solution. Is that fair? That's fair. 
Pyodide is being, or sorry, static deployment. I actually, when I, the engineering paper site, I kind of prototyped it in Dash, kind of did a proof of concept, and it made it really easy to uh, kind of get it going. But I, I, I didn't want to have to run the Python on the server because the server gets a lot more, you know, a lot more computation happening. And also, I wanted a little more control on the the JavaScript side. And so with those two, the Pyodide worked really well there. I could control the user interface, control the computation, have that all in the browser. And yes, that ultimately doing static hosting was kind of the, the big benefit there. Uh, another question, uh, what's the minimum configuration students would need for their laptops? Can something like this, the static website you had, run on four gigabytes of RAM or, or, or less? Yeah, I should be able to. Um, it, it gets a little weird because the browser is very, is trying to control how many resources you're using. So if you have, you know, a really resource constrained computer with a lot of tabs open, it might have issues. Um, but um, it, it'll run pretty much any computer that run Chrome or Firefox. Uh, I have found that Chrome's a little faster for loading up Pyodide um, than Firefox, but it works well on both. Uh, it doesn't work on iOS or Android right now because of that web worker. It just doesn't. It doesn't load properly. And actually, I had a, a question. You mentioned uh, getting uh, C and C++ extensions working. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, and you said Cython was a lot easier. Have you had any experience with number-based extensions? It's sort yeah, of pure Python, but it's compiling to LLVM. Does that yeah, fit in with yeah. Pyodide yet? Yeah, so I'm not sure. I don't, I don't think it's on, if I look quick at the packages. Um, it's not in the packages right now. I was thinking about that from listening to some of the earlier talks. It would be a useful thing to have there. I don't know how it interacts. There's no number there now. I don't know how it interacts with the, the file system. And that's a little tricky in, when you get in the WASM environment. There is a file system there, but then how you interact with it, that can be a challenge. So if it needs to write files and read files, that's possible, but it would probably take some work to kind of make you know, it may not be a POSIX compatible file system, right? So I don't know exactly the details, but there's challenges with working with files in a WASM environment. Uh, and uh, another question: Can you can you speak a little more about the the, the packaging story so to actually deliver the app and how how the tools are used to install? Yeah. So right now, I'm that if I go. Um, if you go to that that page, it's basically I'm using Node. Basically, I use the kind of a, a felt kind of example. They're kind of their starting project, and so Pyodide, I download that and put it in my public folder, so that gets hosted statically, right? Or you can point to the CDN as well. But it's basically a Node project, right? And I have the Python script. So it's the, right now the packaging is Node, to, and I do a Node build. And actually, there's a really nice package called GitHub Pages or gh underscore pages, I think, where you just run a command and it deploys it to GitHub pages. And so it's really simple, npm build, npm deploy, and it's on the recent versions on my GitHub pages. So so it is requiring you to use Node, but it's once you're in that ecosystem, it's pretty easy. OK, that sounds great. Let's, let's all uh, thank Michael again. All right, thank you, everyone.